Herald of Truth presents a special study with Glenn Owen, Getting to Know God. Hello, I'm Glenn Owen, and I really want you to know that I'm happy that you've decided to study the Bible using this series of videos. Let me tell you what I want to accomplish in this study. First of all, I want to inspire you to study your Bible as you never have before. I want you to study it with passion, with openness, and with a commitment that you'll do what you learn God wants you to do. And second, for those of you who have already done what God wants you to do, I want to increase your appreciation for the wonderful gift of God's forgiveness and the relationship you have with him because of Jesus Christ. And then third, for those of you who may not have considered or done the things God wants you to do, I pray that some of the things I'll say will penetrate into your soul and help you examine your relationship with God and that you will decide, no matter what the cost, to obey God's will. He is God and is absolutely and totally worthy of our love and worship. You know, summing it all up, the main purpose of this lesson is to answer some of your questions and to give you enough faith to accept what God says, even though you don't understand everything. You know, it should come as no surprise that it's really hard to describe what God is like. We're the created ones, attempting to talk about the one who created us. And since he gave us our existence, you know, he's in every way greater than we are. I have to admit to you that I begin this study with uneasiness and hesitation. I don't want these lessons to sound like I know all there is to know about God. In all of my years of Bible study, I don't think I have ever been more aware of my own limitations as right now. The subject is so great, my mind is so small, my understanding so weak, the implications so powerful, that frankly, I hardly know where to begin. But begin I must, realizing that the only way I can make any progress at all will be with God's help. He's going to have to help me, or I can't cut it. We cannot, however, be so awed by the greatness of God that we make no attempt to understand, as best we can, what he's told us about himself. You know, it really doesn't make sense that God would have such an intense desire that we know him and have a relationship with him, and then give us a book that none of us can understand enough of it to reach for that relationship. True, we'll never be able to understand everything God has told us in the Bible. But I promise you this, the things we need to know, the things we need to understand in order to have a relationship with God are certainly understandable. The rest we accept by faith and the desire to understand more as we learn more. If we postpone our study until we have all the questions answered, we'll never begin. One of the beauties of studying God's Word is that the more you learn, the more you're able to learn. Frankly, if we think about it, you know, that's the way we've studied about everything. Beginning school children are not expected to understand what college or university students understand. And the truth is, I have found that many people who say that the Bible cannot be understood have never even studied it. Well, we're going to study, and we're going to learn, because our goal is to know God. What does getting to know God involve? Knowing God involves listening to God's Word and applying it as He wishes to our hearts and to our lives. It involves seeing God's character and nature as his word, the Bible, and his works reveal him to us. It also involves accepting his invitations and commands. And then, beautifully, enjoying the love and protection his power and person give to those who submit to his will and way. So this study, we're going to approach it in three different ways. It has to be intellectual. We'll need to think. But more than that, emotional. We're going to need to feel. And with our wills, we will need to make some decisions. As we read the Bible, we'll see that the only true knowledge of God is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. The best place to begin is with the understanding that 
God wants to be known. God is great, he will be sought. God is good, he will be found. Any relationship with God begins with God himself. We don't make friends with God. He makes friends with us. And so I hope in this lesson to not only help you understand more about God himself, but also to show you how much God cares for you, his creation. I want God to become personal to you. Because if God is nothing more than a force or an idea or a principle, there'll be very little impact on us in terms of personal relationship or involvement with God. The only God who can help us is a personal God, one who knows and cares how we feel and think, and one who knows our needs. The Bible says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Again, if you seek him, he will be found by you. And then again, still, I love those who love me. And watch it, those who seek me, find me. Still another place, showing you how much God wants you to find him. You will seek me and find me, when you seek me with all of your heart. You see, God created mankind to have a loving relationship with him. But such a relationship can only exist when we know something about God. God, our creator, knows all there is to know about us. And to me, the great and amazing thing is that God wants us to know him. And he reveals himself to us so that we can know something about him. The Bible, the word of God, is both information and an invitation for us to know God. God is so great that the whole world, even the whole universe, cannot contain him. We use a lot of times the word infinite to talk about God. Infinite means unending, without limits, no boundaries, no horizons. In one way, any search to know God is intimidating. You know what it's like? It's like taking a drop of water from the ocean. I just happen to have some here. And looking at it through a microscope. Let me show you. And you take this drop and you put it on the slide and you put it up here and then you look down at the microscope. And you see all of those molecules and all of its parts. But you've only looked at one drop. And there's a whole ocean out there that has to be examined drop by drop to even begin to get the total of its parts. Since God is limitless, then we also need to know and remember that his attributes are also limitless. We can never really know all there is to know about God. We can only know what he's chosen to tell us. Sometimes, and even what he has told us, we have difficulty you know, getting a grasp on it or, or getting it. But the beauty of it is, hear this, God measures us by our hearts not by our heads. We will look now at two of the many ways that God reveals himself to us. First of all, by what he did and does. The primary or first way that God reveals himself to man is by what he does, by his mighty acts. Because these acts reveal his power. And then we'll also see that God reveals himself by what he says, because the Bible is the book God gave to man so man could see not only who God is, but what he says. The Bible reveals God's perfect will to man. God himself guided the men who wrote the Bible. They wrote what he told them to write. And so the Bible, this beautiful book, is the will of God written down so we can learn and follow what God says. All of this is so great that we cannot find out on our own. We, we simply cannot figure God out. We have to look into his word and see what he tells us about himself. Since God speaks to us through his word, the Bible, then frankly, we ought to regard every occasion of reading or studying the Bible as an encounter with God himself. The fact is, we can't relate to God if we don't know God. Now watch it. I'm not talking about knowing about God. 
that he exists, that he created the world, etc. I'm not even talking about knowing facts about God. I'm talking about knowing God himself. It is absolutely essential to know God. And so our goal in Bible study must be to know God himself better. And our desire has to be to enlarge our personal knowledge of God, not just learning about attributes or works. Because the fact is, God has to be the end of our study about him. Because we have to seek in studying about God to be led to God. We have to turn our knowledge about God into knowledge of God. Because a little knowledge of God is better than a lot of knowledge about God. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God whom you have sent. We simply cannot let God be completely unknown to us. Because an unknown God cannot be trusted, cannot be served, cannot be worshipped, and cannot be enjoyed. Now we have this assurance from Jesus. He said, if any one of you chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I came from my own. You know, even if some scoff at us or make fun of us, we must at least begin our journey to know God. Because if we postpone our trip until the storm dies down, <laughs> we'll never get started. And the truth is, anyone who is actually following a recognized road is not going to be too worried if he hears non-travelers telling each other that no such road exists. We cannot completely define God because we cannot completely understand God. Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot have any knowledge of God, that we cannot grow in our knowledge of God. Because there are things that God has revealed about himself that we can know and we can understand. We'll look at his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. Any concept of God has to begin with his unlimited power. If God's power has any limits at all, he is not God. You see, he has to be powerful enough to do anything he wants. He has to have the power to carry out his will. Without power, his mercy is no more than weak pity. His judgments without power, empty threats. And his promises of protection for his children, just boasting. Oftentimes in the Bible, the word almighty, which is actually El Shaddai, is used to describe God. It's used 48 times in the Old Testament. And the same equivalent word in the New Testament used 10 times. Every time this word is used, in both the Old and the New Testament, it always refers to God, never to anyone else. Because God is indeed almighty. God is El Shaddai. God's power is seen in everything. Let's look at just two things. God's power is seen in the creation of the universe and everything in it. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made with their starry host by the breath of his mouth. God just spoke and it was done. It was as easy for God to create the entire galaxy, the sun or anything else, as it was for him to create a raindrop or a drop of water or a rose. You see, the impossible with God doesn't take a little longer. With God, all things are possible. The Bible says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, we look at his work. But God's power is also seen in his maintenance, his keeping the universe going. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the great deep, O Lord. You preserve both man and beast. God provides rain from heaven for our crops. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. God causes his son to rise and he sends rain. The Bible says exactly that. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. But the greatest demonstration of God's power is seen in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? 
according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Omnipotence means that God has absolute power over all of his creation. But secondly, God's power is also seen in his omniscience. Now, that's a big word that means that God knows everything. The Bible says, God views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. You see, God knows his universe, even the number and names of stars. Can you believe it? He determines the number of the stars and he calls each of them by name. He knows the animal kingdom down to the smallest birds. The Bible says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of the Father. But God also knows man. God knows everything that has been known, that is known, and everything that will be known about man, who is the crown of his creation. The Bible tells us even the number of hairs on our head God knows. It says, even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Now, for some of us, God's job is not quite as hard as it is for others. And God notices every time we brush our hair and knows how many we lose and how many we still have. But most important, God knows man's heart because the word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And listen to this. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The fact is nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered. Everything is laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God knows our every word. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. God knows what we say even before we say it. He knows what is in our deepest being, our hearts. And God foresees all of the acts of men. He knows every choice that will be made and the results of that choice. God foreknows our motives, our choice, and the result of those choices. And yet he does this. He leaves man absolutely free to choose. We are not forced by God to make any choice at all. Two things are very certain. God knows all things, whether past, present, or future. And second, man is a free moral agent. In other words, that means that man is free to make his own choices. There's no place that man can go that God doesn't know. It's, it's not possible to hide even our thoughts from God. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Summing it up, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I'm God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. God, the infinite mind, knows everything. There is nothing that can be known that God does not know. He knows not only what we do, our deeds, but he knows our thoughts as well. God knows everything, whether it be past, present, or future. But here's the beauty of it. God's knowing everything or God's omniscience means that he knows every need, every weakness, every problem, every stumbling block, every anguish, every tear. Listen, if the hairs on our head are numbered, you can be sure our tears are numbered. The third attribute of God, God is omnipresent. We want to look at his omnipresence. There are at least two ways that God is present. God is present, first of all, in his very being, but secondly, he's present in relationship. I'll explain. God is equally present to all men in his being, but now he is only present in any man relationally in his son, Jesus Christ. God is personally present everywhere in regard to his creation and to all living things. You see, man's asking where God is is like the fish swimming around and asking, Where's the water? We know that wherever the fish moves, it is in the water. Wherever the bird flies, it's in the air. And so wherever we move, 
we are in God. The whole world, in a sense, is in God's presence or essence. Can anyone hide in the secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Notice, it does not say I am in heaven and earth, but rather I fill heaven and earth. See, space is infinite. There's no end to it. But God's being fills all of the endless infinity of space. God is present at all points of time and space. God, in the totality of his being, penetrates every small space in the universe. I guess I could say he engulfs the world, you know, the planets we see, even the whole universe, which even the greatest telescopes can't see. Because as huge as the universe is, it still has limits. God is not limited by the universe or even confined to the universe. The universe, for all of its vastness, is measurable. God is not measurable. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. We cannot limit God to a building. We cannot limit God to earth. We can't even limit God to a universe because he's bigger than what he created and he envelops it all. Do I understand that? No. Do I believe it? Yes. A thousand times yes. You see, reality does not depend on our understanding. I don't understand the vastness of the universe, but it is vast. I don't have to understand something for it to be so. If God's omnipresence frightens the wicked, it also should comfort the righteous. Because no matter what the trial, no matter where it happens, no matter the speed with which it assaults us, no matter the strength of its power, God is ever with us. And so God's omnipresence should not frighten us. It should and will comfort those who seek his face and submit to his will. Does he not count my ways and count my every step? God is present with all men as creator. But listen to this. He is only present in men relationally in his son Jesus. In other words, in order to be in good standing with God, it is through Jesus Christ, God's son. But there's still something else we ought to consider. If God is not present with us as followers of his son, Jesus Christ, then he will have no choice but to be our judge on the final day. We'll see more in following lessons, but one thing we need to know, and that the only way that mankind can relate to God in fellowship, blessing, and salvation is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. One of the apostles, Peter, said it like this. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. God's presence in his followers is our greatest blessing. God is with us in our need, our loneliness, our difficult times, danger, death. You know, there are times when he carries us and we only see one set of footprints. We wonder where he is because we thought he's walking beside us. But when he has only one set of footprints, he's carrying us. God is near us when we're sorrowful, giving us comfort and peace. The Bible says, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. In our weakness, God's presence means strength. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God's also present when we're tempted. No thought is hidden. No evil desire or act is secret, but the eye of God sees it. He's present with our heart when we imagine things. He's present with our hands when we act. He's in the greatest darkness as well as the clearest light. He's in the hidden thoughts of the mind, as well as in the most open expressions. God will, when we are tempted, help us by providing a way for us to overcome or escape the temptation. As always, 
It's our choice. Our choice whether we accept his help or not. If we refuse it, it's like the drowning man refusing to accept the rope that's thrown to him. The Bible says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing to the glory of his name. Offer him glory and praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. How awesome his works in man's behalf. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. It is not enough that God is all-powerful, that he's all-knowing, everywhere present. You think about this. If he didn't use his power, his knowledge, and his presence for us, so what? In our next lesson, we'll see that God is also gracious, merciful, loving, and holy. We will go from his greatness to his goodness. We'll press on in our attempt to know God. May God bless you. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus.